Chapter 25 I don't know how much time had passed when there was a knock at the door, but I do know that I felt that knock before I heard it. I had been sitting on the floor, purposely emptying my head of thoughts, simply sitting and existing and breathing. But whoever was at that door had disturbed me on a deeper level than a simple knock should have. I looked at Jenna, but she just rolled to one side and snuggled deeper into the recliner. I got up and pulled an afghan from the back of the couch and covered her with it. She didn't even move. Making a new person from your own body must be exhausting. I walked into the front hallway and could see two shadows through the dust on the windows. I could still feel the uncomfortableness, the tightness in the muscles in my neck, like the feeling of being watched or the inability to excuse oneself from a conversation you don't want to be part of. But even though I wanted to not answer the door, to let them just move on and think the house was unoccupied, I wanted more to make sure that Jenna stayed asleep and rested. And I knew they had already seen me. I opened the door and stepped outside onto the front porch. Standing there was Jeremiah Anderson himself and the woman who had been singing on stage the night before. I clenched and unclenched my fists, staring at him, looking for his master. But Jazeel was not there. This was Jeremiah Anderson. The real human, not the angel-possessed super preacher. And his presence was less than impressive. He looked at me without recognition as he spoke. Good afternoon, sir. I am a minister with Guiding Light Ministries and non-denominational biblical research, teaching, and fellowship ministry here in Kansas City. We were wondering if we could have a minute of your time to speak with you about your spiritual well-being. Do you have any needs for which we can pray with you? The words rolled off his tongue in a rehearsed manner, almost void of expression, but his smile remained frozen on his face. I remembered what Amnon had said about the patterns of the mind and how once the grooves are in place, the host would follow them even when the possessing entity was no longer there. I stood there looking at Jeremiah Anderson, the real Jeremiah Anderson searching his eyes for any sense of recognition inside that shell. His soul was there, but it was frayed and faded, the color of old, dirty denim. I turned to the woman next to him, who was shuffling uncomfortably from foot to foot. Her soul was faded and tired, too, like a calico dress that had been washed too many times, worn and thin. "'Are you okay?' she asked me. "'Do you need anything?' There was real concern in her voice. There was a scratch on her face below her left eye. I thought back to the night before and the church crashing down around them, blown apart by the force of my desire for revenge and the wrath of the Almighty. In all actuality, these people were pitiful and weak without their leader's power. I'm fine, I said. Guiding like ministries? Are you part of that church that was blown apart last night? I saw it on the news. Oh, yes, yes, it was, said the woman next to Jeremiah. But we were protected. Not a single one of the believers was seriously hurt in the blast. That was God's power at work to protect his people. The devil wants nothing more than to keep us from speaking God's truth. That's why we are out here today spreading his love and the word to anyone who will hear. Those who are as sheep will hear his voice. That's what the Bible says. Little did they know that it was God's wrath that blew their church apart, and his angel's mercy that saved them in spite of their sin. No, to them it was a sign of God's special favor to his chosen. I suddenly realized that without Jazeel, Pastor Jeremiah Anderson was just a bland shell of a man. I would invite you both in. Uh, but someone is sleeping inside, and I don't want to wake her, I said. Jeremiah looked up, and his eyes lit up for a second. He looked at his companion, whose eyes opened wide in a worshipful way. He said it would be a pink house when we would find her, said Jeremiah. God fucking damn it. 
I should have kept my mouth shut. Who? I said, feigning ignorance. We should sit down so that we can explain, said the woman, trying to look over my shoulder to see if she could get a glimpse of the sleeping her inside. Jeremiah has some health problems and it isn't good for him to be out in the cold. I told you, you can't go inside, I said, stepping closer to the door to block her view. If you need to sit down, you can sit down out here on the steps, but you cannot go inside. You can explain out here. She helped Jeremiah to sit down on the step. He really did look older even than he had last night. I sat down with my back against the door. This may sound crazy, said Jeremiah, but I started this ministry because an angel of God visited me. I had been the worst sinner, tied up in sins of the flesh, a fornicator, an addict. I had been under the influence of many evils that were running my life, forcing me from one sin to another. My life was horrible. I felt I was beyond redemption. I could see the real sadness in his eyes as he spoke. I could see the pain there under the surface, pain he had caused for himself, but that had been fanned into a huge raging fire with help from the demon named Amnon. But an angel came and told me that he could help me, that I could be used as an instrument of light for the redemption of God's people. He told me that my sins didn't matter if I could but accept that light of God into my heart and destroy my old nature. So I did. And since that day, I've dedicated my life to that mission. I started a church here in Kansas City, as he instructed me. I have brought that church from a small group of believers to a large church. We have seen miracles. We have seen tragedies. But the light of God has been there through all of it, guiding us to those who need us most. My health has deteriorated with each little victory. The angel has told me that it's because the light of God burns so brightly inside of me that my body cannot handle it. I'm afraid that there will be no leader for the people once I'm completely burned away and that my ministry will die and fade. I am not afraid to die. I know once I do, I will be with God and Jesus for all eternity. But all I have worked for will fade. There was one at the beginning who was supposed to be there to help lead the people forward, but she had a change of heart and the darkness took her. The angel told me in a vision that there would be another and that I would find that person's mother here because the child had not yet been born. You don't recognize me, do you, Jeremiah? I asked. No, he said, narrowing his eyes to look at me closely. I know the one that you say was taken by the darkness. I said, I knew her well, Amanda. She was my friend. And that darkness never would have taken her if it hadn't been for you. His eyes kept looking at me from one eye to the other, searching for some recognition. And then the memory sparked. Ray? Yeah, Ray. And I will be damned to hell if I let you get anywhere near that unborn baby inside this house. I stood up and took a step towards him. The host, the shell, the impotent, weak old man named Jeremiah Anderson. I would hazard a guess that you haven't seen your angel friend since last night, have you? I would say that he has abandoned you and your church and fled in fear into the dark. Jeremiah's companion stepped in between us, her eyes lit with a fanatical fire. He said there would be barriers between us and the one we seek. He knew it. He said there would be darkness that calls itself light and that would be you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I cast you out, she yelled. I sighed heavily and took another step towards her and Jeremiah. I think you've watched too many horror shows, lady. Get thee behind me, Satan! She yelled. 
I rolled my eyes. I'm not a demon. I'm not even close. If you ever came in contact with a real one, you would probably shit your pants. Now I have some questions for your preacher man I need answered. She kept babbling incoherently as she backed away from me, her eyes wide in terror. I recognized what she was doing as the same thing Amanda had done at my house the last night I ever saw her. She was yelling now, but she was still firmly in between me and Jeremiah. I was sure she was going to wake Jenna. The screen door slammed behind me. I was right. She was awake. Stay behind me, Jenna, I said. Granny Bean and Mama and Geraldine are going to be here any minute, she said. Who are these people? These people used to know Amanda, I said. You probably should just keep behind me. I'm not scared. I know tongue talking when I hears it, said Jenna. You okay, lady? Jeremiah's companion was still wide-eyed and babbling, her eyes darting from me to Jenna to Jenna's pregnant belly. Behind her, I could hear Jeremiah sobbing. Please, please let me see her, please. I need to know what he told me is true. I need to see it, please. My neighbors are going to have a fit, Ray. Let them come inside. They can't hurt us, Jenna said. And it's my house, Ray. I can let them in if that's what I want. I was about to argue with her when an extended cab pickup truck pulled up in front of the house. A pickup truck filled with fate. Jerry Lynn was the first one out and she was angry. You could feel it coming off of her in waves. Her soul colors looked different, overlaid in a bright electric blue. She walked straight up to Jeremiah, and when she opened her mouth to speak, I knew why. She was indeed a medium. I died because of you, she said. The vowels were crisp. No accent to give away that Jerry Lynn had been raised in the Ozarks. Jenna put her hand on my shoulder and whispered, Is that Amanda? I nodded, unable to speak through the lump in my throat. Jeremiah just looked confused. I've never killed anyone, child. And you are alive. How can you say that you died? You may not have killed me with your hands, Jeremiah Anderson, but your words opened me up to a darkness that caused me to take my own life. Of course, you do not recognize me because you are blind to your own darkness. These are my words now, false prophet. My words that were kept from being spoken. The ones you told me were only darkness and filth. You made me mute, but no more. My voice will be heard and you will come with me now. These words came from Jerry Lynn, but they were Amanda's. Amanda, I said, and her eyes met mine. Ray, she said my name and smiled. I have missed you, true friend. I see clearly now that the shadow has been removed. Thank you. Thank you for trying to help me. But it is I who must save myself. I nodded. I may not be the one to save you, but I will be there to help you. I swear it. You already have helped me, Ray. But my time is almost up, and we need to hurry, said Jerry Lynn. I felt Jenna squeeze my shoulder, pushing down on me for support as she let out an audible gasp. Mama Sue immediately went to her. The baby's a-coming, isn't it, Jenna girl? Jenna nodded and smiled. She took Jenna inside the house, talking the whole time. I'll call Marty. It will be a while with this being your first. Amanda, slash Jerry Lynn, was still glaring at Jeremiah. The baby, he whimpered. The angel told me to come here and bless the baby. His female companion helped him as he struggled to his feet. He was on pre-programmed autopilot. He had been sent here by Jazeel to do one task, and overriding that priority was just not in the picture. 
even though he was being faced by a woman brought back from the dead to confront him with his sins. You ain't never going to touch that baby, Granny Bean finally spoke. I hadn't even noticed her standing next to the truck, leaning on her cane, the cookie tin under one arm. Her voice echoed around us, stronger than should have been generated by a seemingly feeble old woman. You people, you're all devil-possessed. I command you in the name of Jesus to leave this house, yelled the girl, supporting Jeremiah. Fuck off, said Jerry Lynn slash Amanda. I could see the red and orange coming to the forefront as her voice went back to the lilting Ozark twang. This don't concern you, bitch. Get off my sister's lung. Get the fuck out. The girl's mouth opened in shock, but nothing came out. Granny Bean shuffled her way up to the front steps and next to Jeremiah's companion. She took her hand in her wrinkled one and smiled sweetly. Child, you ain't got no idea what you're dealing with here. I suggest you walk on down the street and let us do what needs to be done. When Granny let go, I could see the smudge of black ash on the girl's hand. She blinked three times and looked around her. Her soul color started to come back. She looked momentarily confused, but nodded. I think I'm going to head home now. I think I miss my mom. I haven't seen her in a while, she said. That's a good girl, said Granny Bean. It's been a long time since you've been with family, hasn't it? The girl nodded. It's okay. I'll take care of the pastor, said Granny, smiling sweetly. And she left. Who are you? asked Jeremiah, his confusion intensifying as he looked at Granny's blackened palms. Oh, I'm just a grandmother, just a silly old woman said Granny, putting her palm to his face. Jeremiah collapsed. Crow, she asked. Yes, ma'am, I said. This woman deserved the title. I got some chores for you, she said. You go put this sack of shit in the car. Go ahead, cover him up with the blanket in the back. I don't want him to catch his death. We need some work out of him yet. And after that, you bring me that pot of ashes that's sitting on the floor in the front. If Jenna's going to be birthing this babe, she's going to need some barriers. That baby is a special one and ain't much going to make it through that there black salt. I did as I was told. She took the pot and began sprinkling the salt around the edges of the property. While the ashes spread there earlier by Jenna were strong enough to keep everything but the most powerful demons away, this was even more intense. I could see a wall going up around the place. There wasn't much that could make it through all that, but I was going to make sure that she was protected. I pulled out my phone and called Mike. I think I know where Jazeel's headed, I said. I quickly explained and gave him the address. He was there before Granny had finished with the salt. The motorcycle he pulled up on was a Harley, matte black with silver skulls over the license plate and the headlight. He was dressed in his battle gear, all black leather from boots to coat. Mystical symbols tattooed in a deeper black than his skin covered his bald head. The heat from his sword strapped on his back made the air appear to ripple around him. Where he stepped, the snow melted away. Jenna was right. The neighbors were going to wonder about her. He walked up to the house and stopped at the barrier for a moment, then brushed his hand in front of him from one side to the other, like he was pushing away a curtain. <laughs>